think I'm a little behind on the recordings, guys, so uh, I'll get on that here uh, pretty quickly to catch myself up. Um, but let's go ahead and let's take a look at the uh, where we left off for chapter three. And remember, we're into the balance sheet now. We were working our way through current assets. We talked about cash. We talked about accounts receivable. And now we're turning our attention to another current asset. Well, it's often a current asset. If the term of the note is a year or less, it would be a current asset. But we're going to talk about a note payable now. And we'll continue our walk through the asset side of the balance sheet uh, here tonight, getting into inventory, getting into fixed assets, depreciation methods, and then um, there are some um, areas dealing with non-monetary exchange and impairment of fixed asset, uh, intangible assets, and the impairment of our assets, which I think we'll probably get to those parts uh, next time. Okay, so we should be able to get all the way through fixed assets tonight. Okay, but as we're talking about um, our accounts receivable still actually. And what happens? We have an account receivable and maybe the company wants to cash in that account receivable before it is due. Now, of course, a company would likely do this because they're running into a cash situation. They want to try to generate cash a little more quickly. And so they go ahead and they simply uh, are going to borrow against that receivable and get the cash. Well, we call that process pledging. Okay, and pledging is a process where the company takes their account receivable and uses it as collateral for a loan. So I ask you to loan me some money, you say you got any collateral, and I start showing you all these different assets that you're not interested in. You say, well, what else you got? So, well, I have these receivables outstanding. You say, fine, in the event that you don't pay me the loan back, I'm going to take those receivable from you, okay? So if that's the case, what happens? I would retain the title to the receivable and therefore I would only have to disclose in my footnotes that there is essentially a lien against my accounts receivable. It is pledged as collateral, but I do not, the reason we say the accounts receivable is not adjusted, I do not remove the receivable from the books. I still leave that receivable on the book because I simply have pledged it as collateral against a loan. Now, of course, when I get the cash from you, I'm going to have to what, put a, uh, that I have a no payable, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now, you could also factor an account receivable. And with factoring the account receivable, it can be without recourse or it can be with recourse. Now, if it is without recourse, that means that the sale is final and we're going to sell that to a factor and that factor assumes risk of any losses, okay? So the factor is what? The factor is the buyer of the receivable. And if they're unable to collect, they have no recourse against the seller. That would be the company that had the receivable that is selling them. So if they come back to me and say, hey, you know, you gave me this receivable to collect and uh, the guy didn't have any money and he couldn't pay me, well, hey, that's your loss, okay? So this factor often will ask for a margin, okay? And what happens is the factor asks for a margin and that margin is a cushion against the potential that they may not be able to uh, collect the receivable. So we're going to talk about this margin here and I'm going to go ahead and come up with some um, facts here just to make some sense out of these numbers. So company, okay, you can just write this down, company, factors, accounts receivable without recourse. And the account receivable is going to be uh, $1,200 of accounts receivable probably. So you said that first, 1,200 accounts receivable. And the company factors the account receivable of $1,200 without recourse for $1,100. Now you sit there and you say, well, 
you know, why would you give up account receivable of 1200 for only 1100? Well, I need the money and the factor's got to eat. He's got to get some money out of this deal. He's just not going to collect this money for nothing for me. So he says, hey, give me 1100. I'll give you 1100 bucks. You give me the receivable 1200. I'm going to try to collect them. Now, the factor margin that we're really trying to illustrate here is going to equal hundred dollars. Now this hundred dollars is factor margin is a cushion that the factor holds against the potential that they may not be able to uh, collect the entire amount on the receivable. Now, if you use those numbers, you can go ahead and you can fill in these X's here because you know I don't necessarily care for X's when we can use a numerical example. So let's start with the fact that they are factoring $1,200 of accounts receivable. So they credit the account receivable for 1,200. What happens? We're only gonna get up front cash of what? Of $1,000 because the factor wants to hold back a hundred, that's the factor margin in the chance that they aren't able to collect. And then the loss here at this point is what? Is the 1200 minus the 1100 amount that we agreed that we would let the factor, uh, that we would take from the factor, okay? Now, at that point in time, we have due from factor, which is an asset, due from, factor of $100. And we're hoping that the factor can go and collect all that money, right? And then uh, they'll give us that $100 back. Now, let's say the factor indeed does collect the entire $1,200. What's the factor going to do? The factor is going to send us cash of 100 And we, of course, then will do what? Credit do from factor for the hundred dollars because now the factor has given us that hundred dollars and we're not expecting any more cash on that right and the loss sits there if we wanted to tie up uh, tee up the loss the loss sits there at the hundred dollars which again is the difference between what between the twelve hundred and the total eleven hundred dollars with the cash we receive now it is possible of course that what the factor is going to come back and say, hey, I wasn't able to collect all the cash. And we're going to say, oh, well, there's nothing that uh, you can do to us except keep the factor uh, margin. So what's going to happen at that point, once the factor tells us they weren't able to collect and they're mad, <laughs> there's nothing else they can do to us, but they're not going to give us that $100 cash. We'll debit loss for $100 and we'll credit what due from factor for 100. And now, of course, my loss is what is 200, which is the difference between the 1200 receivable I had. And now this um, $200 of loss because I only received $1,000 on this. Okay. Question. Okay. Now they tell us here the entry to the asset due from factor reflects the proceeds retained by the factor. Uh, this protects the factor against, um, you know, the fact that they basically won't be able to collect for whatever reason. You don't need to get into the reasons there that they maybe couldn't collect, but just flashcards to remember the um, point of the account due from factor. Question. Uh, I have a question. So when, when you say, oh, the factor cannot cannot collect the money, it's not the entire $1,200, it's, it's Correct. just $100? I don't know how much they can't collect, but they couldn't collect at least, well, I guess in my example, they were at least $100 short, but I don't care if they were $1,200 short, all they got to do against us at that point is keep up the factor margin. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. Now um, you come over and you take a look at the with recourse, okay? And the with recourse, can either be um, treated as a sale or a collateralized borrowing, okay? So there are two treatments that are possible. It's either a sale or it is collateralized borrowing. Now, in order to be considered a sale, and let's just go ahead guys and flashcard the requirements here 
for the sale because it must meet all of the um, must meet all the following conditions. The transfer, that's the seller's obligation for the uncollectible receivable, can be easily estimated. The transfer surrenders control. What does that mean? I don't have the option to later on come back to you and say, hey, you know those receivables that I sold you? I want them back. No, I've surrendered control. And the seller cannot be required to replace the receivables that couldn't be collected, but may be required to replace the receivables with similar receivables. So what happens? Let's say I sit here and I give you a bunch of receivables and I say, here, go collect on these. And these pens represent the receivables, right? And I give those to you. Then what? Then you come back and you say, you see these two? I couldn't collect these. And so I say, okay, I reach back into my bag of receivables and I say, here you go, go and try and collect on these. So I'm not obligated to make good on these, but I have to replace the ones that you could collect with similar ones, then I can treat that entire thing as a sale. But I have to meet all of those criteria to treat it as a sale. And if I do, I can go ahead and debit the, um, cash, of course, that you give me at that point, credit the account receivable, and there probably would be some loss because, because again, they're always going to try to make a, um, you know, a profit on this whole uh, deal, the person that has taken those receivables off our hands. If any of the conditions are not met, okay, if any of these conditions are not met, then it is treated as a loan and otherwise, in other words, it is what? It is collateralized borrowing. It is collateral for a loan. In other words, we're back to what? We're back to where we started this whole discussion a minute ago up here. It is simply collateral for a loan. We have simply pledged the receivable. Okay, if any of those conditions are not met right there, I'm trying to connect that up there. Of course, now I lost my whole line, but I think you know what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to come up from there. To here is collateral for a loan at that point. Question. Okay. Okay, good. Now they get into a note receivable, which for some reason in my mind, I was thinking that we were starting that uh, class with that. I forgot that we still have that issue about uh, factoring account receivable, but let's look at um, note receivable. Okay. Now they tell us that our presentation, and we say for financial statement purposes, um, unearned interest are deducted from the face amount of the related promissory note, okay? And this is necessary in order to report the note receivable at present value, okay? Now you can flashcard that. And uh, what I'm going to do here, and I always struggle a little bit as to where exactly I wanna write all this. Um, there's not a heck of a lot of room right here to write the things I want to write. Um, let's go ahead, though, and let's start, I think, writing uh, right here where I'm going to give you some numbers to play with here and kind of get a little bit more of a, a contextual sophistication to understanding than just what they're telling us here, because you will see some questions in your homework where they'll be expecting you to calculate interest revenue on a note receivable. And then when we get to the um, liability section of our discussion, chapter five, you'll be calculating interest expense on note payable. So I think it's worth our time to sort of stop here and uh, put together a little example, okay? So we have, let's say a situation where we have a note receivable of 50,000 and it's going to require, that says require, let's rewrite that. Payback by five years of $10,000 payments. Now, of course, it would be nice if, you know, somebody handed you $50,000 and said, 
pay me back over five years, give me 10,000 a year. Only your parents loan money to you that way, <laughs> okay? The reality is that they're not gonna give me the full 50,000, right? They're going to discount that note receivable. Now, I'm going to assume in this example that the interest rate on this is 10%, okay? And what I would do is to figure out the present value of this note, I would go to present value of annuity table, I would go to the five year row, I would go to the 10% column and I would find a factor there. And that factor would be 3.7908. Now, before you get scared and think that I've memorized the present value table, I obviously looked that up you know, before we were doing this, okay? But the factor 10% for five years is 3.7908. I would take that and I would multiply that by 10,000. Now, when I do, which is the annual payments, I get 37,908. So when I make this loan in this note receivable, I'm going to do what? I'm going to credit the cash. And you see guys how I kind of struggle as to where to write all this, but I credit the cash, okay, for what? put my credit to cash here of 37,908. That's 37,908. That's that number I just wrote right there. That's the present value. So I hand the borrower $37,908 of cash. So I have to credit that. I debit note receivable for the full 50,000. Okay. And sometimes students will ask me, I don't understand where the discount comes from, well, the discount is the difference between what? Between the 50,000 and the present value of that note, which was the 37,908. In other words, I have a discount now of what? 12,092. So I go ahead and I credit the discount to make this journal entry balance, of course, of 12,092. And of course, I'm not lining my numbers up very well, but you get the point, okay? Credit cash, 37,908. Credit the discount, 12,092. Debit note receivable, 50,000. Any questions so far? Now, when I prepare my balance sheet, and I'm just gonna do the note receivable section, okay, there's my balance sheet. I have no receivable of what? 50,000. I have the discount of 12,092. And I have the net note receivable of 37,098. Net note, net, that says net note receivable, 37,000. 098, um, or what is it? So it's 098 or 908? 37,908. Come on, guys. If I ask for help, I expect help. 37,908? Yes. Right? Okay. Okay, good. So I have that showing on my balance sheet and that's exactly what this thing was trying to tell you is okay, it wasn't making it to me and clear enough, but that's what they were trying to say is you subtract the discount off of the note and you get the discount by the difference between the present value of the note and the amount of the uh, gross note receivable. And that gives you um, the amount of discount and then you display it like that on the balance sheet. So it is showing a present value, isn't it? Okay. Now, <clears throat> any question? Now, just to take this into um, the, the, the first year of this note. So what happens? Um, I'm going to assume that we received the money on January 1st, um, that we made the net, we, 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 you know, issued the note on January 1st, year one. So on January 1st, year two, of course, we're going to receive what? We're going to debit cash for 10,000. That's that first payment. And we're going to go ahead and credit the note receivable for the uh, 10,000. 
Okay. Now, originally, if I were to tee up the note receivable, and this is what drives me nuts, is just trying to fit all this in. The note receivable, originally we had debited it for what? For 50. Now we just credited it over here for what? For 10. So now the balance is what? Is 40,000? So when I prepare my balance sheet, immediately after that first payment, the note receivable is showing what? Is showing 40,000. And now the discount, okay? And the discount, we had originally credited it for what, 12,092? Yes. Okay. But now we have to amortize that discount. And so what happens? Well, the interest for the first year was what? Since it was 37,908, the interest for the first year on that note times 10% was what? Was 3,700. And um, $91, give or take a couple cents, guys. I don't want to get into a whole big rounding, I mean, the whole big, you know, cents calculation here. So just rounding $3,791. Okay. So what'll happen? I will go ahead and at the end of that first year, and I probably should have shown that at the end of that first year, I will do what? I'll debit interest, I mean, I'll debit the uh, discount, excuse me. Sometimes I find myself doing the accounting for the uh, borrower. I'll debit the discount, what, 3791, and I'll credit what, I'll credit interest revenue, 3791. That's the interest revenue, which is the amount of the interest revenue that had been earned because that note was outstanding for the full year at 10%. And when I debit the discount, now the discount has what? 12,092 minus the debit of 3791. Um, that now leaves my discount at what? 80. 300 guys is the balance here. Yep. Somebody check me then. 8301. Yeah. Okay. So now the discount is 8301. Okay. And so if you take the discount of 8301 off of the now uh, new carrying amount of the note receivable of 40,000. The net note receivable, again, my big challenge is the fact that I write stuff all over the place on this, is now what, 31,700? Something like that, okay. 31,699. 699, okay, you, you annoying accountants, okay. 699, <laughs> okay, and then I go ahead and I do what, for that, Second years of interest revenue, I'll multiply that by 10%, okay? And that'll give me the interest revenue of the next year of what, now that you got me locked into these funky numbers, three, one, six, nine or something, and so on. Yeah, okay. yes, correct. Now, I don't think it's a bad exercise, guys, for you to go ahead and keep going with this example. Go ahead and go through the the um, five payments and watch how that note amortizes down because there's a chance that on your exam they may give you a simulation which they expect you to be able to walk through a couple of three years on something like that so it's not bad practice question okay good good glad you got that it's funny i have um you know friends colleagues sometimes it will say how am I supposed to deal with one of these notes receivable again? I just got one of these things and I forgot how I'm supposed to amortize note receivable on this. So it's good that you understand that. Okay. Okay, good. Now, 
that's uh, what happens with the uh, valuation is all we talked about there. Now, we could do something called discounting a note receivable. Now, with discounting a note receivable, it's like factoring, but we use a different word, but it's essentially the same idea that we're going to give up the accounts receivable, uh, excuse me, the note receivable and try to get cash. And when we do, we will get cash. And when we do, we will do it with recourse or without recourse. Now, if it, the note has been discounted with recourse, okay, then the note receivable is still reported on the balance sheet with a corresponding contra account showing in the notes that the receivable has been discounted, but we just leave it on the balance sheet and we don't take it off of the balance sheet. If we want to in a with recourse situation, we could go ahead and remove the note receivable from the balance sheet, but now we'll have to show a liability. We'll have to actually book a liability saying that, hey, there's a chance that somebody uh, will come back. So you can either leave it alone with footnote disclosure that there's essentially a lien against that receivable, or you can simply take it off the books, but now you have to show a liability because essentially there's a chance that somebody will come back and you'll have that contingent liability. Okay. Did I say we have to actually book a liability? I misspoke there. We would have to disclose a contingent liability. We'd have to disclose a contingent liability. Um, we wouldn't have to book a liability because it's you no, know, not likely that someone's going to basically have a with recourse loan in which it's more likely than not that we won't be able to pay them back. <laughs> okay, so uh, we would simply have to disclose uh, that we have a contingent liability in the uh, chance that maybe, um, you know, they get, they have to come back on us. Okay, now that's without recourse. If it's with recourse, then what? Then it is essentially a sale. It means that the note has been sold outright and therefore it will be removed from the balance sheet. And so you can uh, flashcard that. And then this is a very good example. I'm gonna put it, in, put it in here, good example as to how you will do the calculations to remove that note receivable uh, from the books when you have a with out recourse sale, meaning that it has been sold outright. So you take a look at this and you have this uh, Jordan Corporation and they have a 40. And um, let me start out by saying, when you look at questions like this, just try to visualize what it is that's happening because the questions are often written the way they've done this example here. And it almost sounds like a storybook. Hey, with Jordan Corporate, once upon a time, right? Jordan Corporation had a $40,000 90-day note from a customer dated September 30th, year three, due December 30th, uh, year three. So that's the 90 days. It's what? All of October, all of November, all of December. Now in accounting, we typically, we, we just assume a 30-day month. We assume that every month has 30 days. And sometimes students bristle at that a little bit. And I'm just like, well, look, guys, you don't argue with me when I say to calculate depreciation expense, you divide it by 12. Well, that's saying that every month has the same number of days, right? Okay, so um, you just assume a 30-day uh, a month, every month has 30 days for purposes of the CPA exam, okay? Now, the note that we have has an interest rate of 12%. And then what happened is we got tired of waiting for our money. For some reason, we needed our money sooner. So what did we do? On October 30th, which was 30 days after issue, issued on September 30th, October 30th is 30 days after that. Huh? Jordan Corporation takes the note to the bank, which is willing to discount it at a 15% interest rate. So I take this note. I said, look, I was able to hold it for 30 days, but I need the money now. Will you take the note and give me my money early? And the notes, the bank, excuse me, says yes, but I'm going to charge you 15%. So you're essentially borrowing that money early from the bank. And um, the, um, they want us to compute 
the amount of cash that we would have gotten uh, from the bank uh, since you know the um, bank had to wait now 60 days to actually get their money. So they're going to charge us interest, okay? So you take a look at this and what happens? You have this face of the note. And if we could have waited the full 90 days, we would have got 1,200. So we went to the bank and said, look, this thing is going to be worth 41,200, the principal plus the interest. What will you give us for it? And they said, well, look, we're going to charge you interest because you're getting your money 60 days early. So we're going to charge you 15% interest on that. We're going to charge you 10,030. So if we could have only waited the full term, we would have gotten 41,200. The bank takes their cut, which is what? This 10,030, that's that number right there, that uh, they're saying, hey, we're gonna charge you because you're getting your money early. So the bank is going to give us what? $40,170. So some questions will ask you that. What is the proceeds? What are you gonna get? What is the proceeds that you'll get from the bank when you take this um, you know, in a discounted without recourse. Some questions you'll see will just simply ask you, well, what was the interest on the entire deal for this Jordan Corporation? So what happens? Well, they got the 40,170. 40, they had loaned what? 40,000. So they made interest of 170. That's the other way they may ask you about this. Question. Okay, good. That's good practice, guys. Uh, I really think that you may want to review this again before you finish your homework. Okay, so you'll be making the flashcards that I've talked about this, but before you start getting the multiple choice questions in this area, I'd recommend you study that example again because you're going to see here in a couple of seconds. In fact, let's do question two first and then we'll go back and do question one. And you're going to see that if you follow that process we just learned, uh, we just reviewed, then this is th that it will be able to be applied to this question. So let's just go ahead and launch our first multiple choice question for tonight.
Okay, guys, we're at the three minute mark. I'm going to give you 15 more seconds on this one. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. So make your choice here. Okay. And um, the folks that uh, did answer the question, I'm not sure what happened to some of us, um, got it correct. Okay. And um, when you look at this, um, everyone who tried it got it correct. Okay. So when you look at this, we have what? We have this. 500,000, okay, that was borrowed. Let me stop sharing so it's out of the way so you can watch the calculations, okay? But I think everybody knows how to do it, but let's just redo it. 500,000, okay? And uh, the interest rate on the note was 8%, okay? Now, it was what? It was a 12-month um, loan. And so if they could have waited they would have earned 40,000 of interest. So they would have ultimately received what? Their 500,000 plus the 40,000 interest. So they would have gotten what? 540,000 on this. But they decided, you know, we don't want to wait the full um, 12 months on this. Okay, it was a one year note. We're going to discount it early. So they held the note for what? for six months. So they essentially went to the bank and said, hey, bank, we want to borrow this 540 from you and uh, for six months. So what happens? The bank says, OK, but we're going to charge you what? 10 percent on this. So 540 times what? Times 10 percent times what? Six twelfths or one half because we're not borrowing that for the full year only for half the year. That gives us what? That gives us the 27,000, I believe, of interest that we're being charged by the bank for this discounting. So if we could have waited, what, the full year, we would have got 540, but now the bank is charging us, what, this 27,000 of interest. So the net proceeds that we're going to receive is 513. Okay, question, and I'm expecting questions because of the one, two, three, four, one, two, three, 12, 13, 14, 15, minus three of the 12 of us that are here, only nine answered. So what happened to the other three? What's the question? Somebody that didn't choose the right answer. What's the question? I chose the right answer, but I have a question. Yeah. Okay. So why would you do the 540 and not 520 since they only held it for half the year? Well, if they could have waited the whole year, they would have got 540, right? So they essentially were going to the bank asking to borrow the 540. By borrowing right. off the 540. Well, yeah, okay. They're borrowing. The, the, the note is worth 540. They're asking for their money early, but the bank is saying, well, we're going to charge you the interest on that. I mean, um, if they got the five, if you use the 520, that essentially be saying that they are giving them the 520 now but they're gonna charge them interest for getting any of this money early because they don't get any of it until what? Until 12 months for, or until six months from now at this point, right? Okay, all right, that makes sense, thank you. Okay, yeah, I mean, sometimes you gotta kind of talk yourself through these, but I think if you do this enough, you'll see that this is, this is pretty, this is a, the kind of question I think that's, that has a good chance of, and that's the kind of the reason I'm kind of forcing the issue of what did you all put down? What did you think was your question on it? Because this is the kind of question that I think um, a lot of candidates struggle with because they don't repeat this enough. And so it takes them too long. 
they get lost in the question and they burn up a bunch of time getting the wrong answer. Whereas if you have a routine as to how you work these, what you're doing is you're getting the right answer and you're probably getting it quicker than the average student on the exam. So if you're planning to pass the exam, this is the kind of muscle tissue I need you to work on right here. And I assume you're passing, you're planning to pass. So is there any question on this? Okay, don't get me into the business, guys, where I'm going to start calling out names to say, well, what is your question on this, Susie? What is your question on this, Billy? Okay, <laughs> all right, we don't have a Billy and a Susie, but you know what I mean. Okay, all right, let's take a look back at this first question uh, since we went straight to the second one. Okay, guys, we're coming up on the two minute mark. So I'm going to go ahead and um, end the poll. And um, looks like most of us, what am I doing here? Looks like most of us got it right. I'm just trying to move the poll so where I can end the poll. Okay. And it uh, looks like most of us got this right. Um, we had. Um, um, 12 out of the, um, 12 out of 12 answered it, two missed it, okay, and, um, we can see that, um, the answer is D, okay, so most of us got it right, that's not for that question, of course, it's for this one up here, okay, but what happens? Uh, you take a look at this, and guys, this is a question, even though I gave you two minutes, I really would expect you to have worked maybe in 30 seconds or maybe maybe a minute to read through this, because some of this Gar versus Ross versus Gar and all that. But Gar company factored its receivable without recourse to Ross Bank. So Ross is the bank, Gar is the seller, and they factored it what? without recourse okay so what happens as a result it's without recourse that means it is a sale to ross and there is no recourse so the risk goes to what goes to ross in that case okay so um pretty easy uh definitional uh type question but uh it's important that you you know practice with those not just kind of sit on the sidelines for these and um, you know, make sure that they only take you the two minutes and that you get them right, of course. Or not two minutes, but really, I'd say no more than a minute on a question like this.
Okay. Question? Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's talk about inventory. I think you see the approach here, guys, is that we are simply going through, walking our way through the balance sheet here, now going to inventory. Now, when we look at inventory questions on the exam, inventory is always going to be at least 10 points on the exam. You can expect a good set of inventory questions. And I said that last time we talked when I went through the table of contents, but I want to emphasize you've got to understand inventory. Okay. Now you got to remember how to count for your inventory. Now, when they ask inventory questions on the exam, they typically break them into um, what I'll call either four or five categories, depending on how you want to look at it. One is what are the items that should be included in our inventory? We're going to see that if items are in transit, in some cases, we will include them. In other cases, we will not. Okay, so what items physically should be counted as part of our inventory? Okay, the second thing that they're going to look at is, well, what cost should be accumulated into our inventory? Okay, so it's what physical items, the number of physical items, and what cost should we gather into our inventory? That's the second thing. The third thing that they are going, and it's not in this order, I'm just counting up the type of things that they'll ask, but the third thing that they um, will ask us is, well, how should we value the inventory? And we're going to see that the general answer is what? Cost. But if the value of the inventory is falling below cost, we'll have to write it down to that lower cost. The fourth thing that they're going to ask us is, do we know certain cost flow assumptions? And the big ones, as you know, are FIFO, LIFO, weighted average. And then there's a couple of smaller, more boutique sort of inventory methods like dollar value LIFO that we're also going to have to understand something about. And then the reason I say four or five things, they're going to expect us to be able to account for our inventory using the different cost flow assumptions under both the periodic method and the perpetual method. So that's why I say four or five, because I'm not sure if, you know, that last fifth one, perpetual versus periodic, should actually be rolled into the LIFO, FIFO, weighted average, and other inventory methods that we uh, will talk about a little bit, okay? Okay, so that's where we're going. And on the CPA exam, they focus, uh, for the FAR section anyway, they focus on retail, okay? In other words, they're assuming your Nordstrom. The inventory has already been manufactured and you're selling it to somebody else, okay? Now, these other uh, things that you see here, raw materials, work in process, finished good. Uh, for my folks that uh, just got done with the EC last, um, last uh, trimester, I think that you um, are very familiar with that. And that's where you'll see that discussion is in the BEC. If you're gonna get to that later, we'll, you'll, revi you'll, revi you'll revisit those in BEC, okay? Okay, now, so what items should be included in inventory? And the big deal here is goods in transit, okay? Now, I'm not trying to insult anyone's intelligence here. I, I think you know this, but let's just review it free onboard shipping point, okay? And what? Title passes to buyer when the goods are delivered, okay? So what happens? That means that goods in transit included in what? In the buyer's ending inventory. Okay, so they say when the goods are delivered to a common carrier, mean, meaning what? As soon as those goods go on the truck, they become what? They become part of the buyer's ending inventory, and it is what? It is a sale to the seller. Okay, so goods are shipped what? Goods are shipped December 20th, they what? They don't arrive until January of the next year. 
at the end of the year, even though those goods were still in transit at December 31st, they are included in the what? In the buyer's ending inventory and they are what? Excluded from the seller's ending inventory and it is a sale to the seller, right? Okay. Now, conversely, if it is what? Free on board destination, okay? Free on board destination, title passes the buyer when they actually receive the goods from the common carrier. Okay, so what does that mean? Goods in transit are excluded from buyer's ending inventory. And of course, they are included in the seller's ending inventory in that case, even though they may not even be on their premises anymore. They ship the goods from New York and they're in Kansas City at the end of the year uh, and they're going to San Francisco. Um, they would be excluded, uh, included in the, in the seller's ending inventory, excluded from the buyer's ending inventory and what? No sale to seller. Question, I think we know this all already, right? But if you got a flashcard, any of this guys, any of this guys, I'm gonna just put down optional flashcard. If you got a flashcard, any of what we put here, anything that we're putting down here, go for it or look at your Becker flashcards and see if it's in there. Because sometimes, and I don't know why to this day, I've only been looking at this stuff for 40 years, I guess. Yeah, it is 40 years, Jesus. Okay, I've only been looking at this stuff for 40 years and I still get my wires crossed on some of these questions. So make sure you've got that sharpened up uh, nice and tight for the exam, okay? Okay, good. Now you come over and we talk about consigned goods. So what happens here? Well, let's say, you know, you pass the CPA exam, you get your license and then you decide to write a book called Mothers, Don't Let Your Children Grow Up to Be CPAs. Okay, and you go to, uh, you know, one of these bookstores that are still in, in business. What is it? Is, is it Barnes and Noble that's still in business? Okay, so you go to Barnes and Noble and you say, hey, will you please, uh, you know, buy this book off of me, include it in your inventory? It's going to be a great seller. And they say, no, thank you. And then they look at you and they say, come here. We'll take pity on you, kid. Look, what you can do is you can put your books over here in the corner. You can put a little cardboard cut out of yourself standing there. And um, if somebody buys the books, we'll keep 1% and we'll remit the rest over to you if somebody buys it. Okay. So the end of the year comes, what happens? In that situation, you are the cosignor and Barnes and Noble would be the cosignee. Okay. So what happens? The cosignor should include the cosigned goods in your ending inventory because the risk of loss is what is on you even though the cosignee uh, would uh, actually physically possess the goods okay the cosignee in that case is what is going to be uh, barnes and noble so cosignee would what would exclude that says exclude goods from ending inventory, okay? And the reason I'm writing that is they may give you a question where they'll say, well, you know, Barnes and Noble, Cosigny held so many goods on consignment, you're gonna have to know to what, subtract those out, right? Those should not be included, okay? Okay, good. Now you come over and um, take a look at the next page, okay? And so we understand what items to be included. Now we want to know how we should value the inventory, okay? And they tell us that the inventory should be valued at cost, okay? Now, what are the costs, okay? It's the price paid or consideration given to acquire that asset the inventory okay now we can do a real good job here so we're going to have to write a couple things in here that i do want you to flashcard okay flashcard um if buyer pays shipping cost 
if buyer pays shipping costs, how should we account for that shipping cost? It's included in inventory, right? Excellent. It is included in inventory, yes. Very good. Beautiful, okay. If, and I think you guys know where I'm going with this, if seller pays freight costs, then what? Now the seller pays. Michael, you can answer again if you know the answer. Don't be shy. Now I called you out that you don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah. I, isn't that just a selling expense? Yeah, exactly. It's a selling expense. It's reported on the, on the income statement, not the balance sheet, right? It's a selling expense. Okay, it's just listed as a selling expense. It's selling an administrative expense on the income statement because we're trying to match it with the sale, right? Okay, so make sure you're clear on that because there's questions that are gonna, definitely gonna ask you that. Buyer pays, it's part of the inventory cost. It doesn't hit the income statement until we do what? Until we sell the items as part of the cost to get sold, right? If seller pays the freight cost, then uh, that is a selling expense. And sometimes, you'll see these referred to what? Freight out, and that's when the seller pays, or we use, I guess, I guess is it a term of art, like they say, we use what? We use freight in when the buyer pays. So the exam may not be as friendly as saying, no, oh, they expect you to be a little jargonistic here. And they'll sit there and they'll say, uh, you know, the freight in, the freight out, and you have to know how to handle those. Question? Okay, now um, we understand what cost, um, but let's go a little bit further. Let's say I want to uh, sell strawberries and I'm gonna sell them in winter time. So I gotta keep them frozen, don't I? Okay, because frost strawberries grow uh, in the summer, and if someone's going to walk in in December to get strawberries, then I'm going to have to preserve them somehow. So I get a big freezer. Is the cost of that freezer part of the cost of the inventory? Is the cost no. of that freezer part of the cost of the inventory? No. Why not? Um, cost. It's probably an asset, isn't it? Well, it's not the upfront cost. Let me make that a little more clear. A little more clear. The, the depreciation on that freezer. Am I going to? So I'm going to credit accumulated depreciation. What am I going to debit? A balance sheet account or inventory account or depreciation expense? Depreciation expense. Depreciation expense. No. That's... Well, you, can, you can't include the shelves you keep your boxes on as part of your inventory. So why would you keep a freezer that you keep your strawberries in as part of inventory? Because that is providing me time utility. Any cost that provides me time or place utility is considered part of the cost of that inventory item. So if they have equipment that they're using and they're depreciating that equipment and they're using it to store inventory at a certain temperature so that it can be, you know, sold, you know, you know, whenever they want, that's providing time utility that is considered an inventory cost. Okay. Um, shelves, warehouse costs, um, you know, a lot of times they'll go ahead and depreciate that as expense because the shelves are there, you know, year round and it probably doesn't make a uh, uh, material difference. Okay. But when you start talking about, you know, machinery that you're using 
to store something, then they start saying you should capitalize that cost as part of your cost of inventory. Think about it, guys. When you are manufacturing items, the depreciation on the factory building goes where? Goes into your overhead, doesn't it? And then you apply that overhead to your work in process, and then it moves from work in process to finished goods. Same basic principle that's going on here, okay? Now, again, I don't know that the exam gets quite off into that in much detail, but I don't want you to get, you know, side swiped or whatever they call it, blindsided by a question that sits there and considers that point and you haven't heard any discussion of it previously. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and you take a look at um, departures from the cost basis. Okay, so we've got these costs that are being included, the freight in is being included, the cost that we paid for it, okay, is being included in, and we're going to talk about these different cost flow assumption methods here in a couple of minutes, okay? But we have what? We have these uh, departures, okay? So I want you to flashcard the three exceptions from um, cost basis. Okay, the three exceptions from cost basis. And they kind of split them up a little bit. One is if you are in the business that you are mining gold, okay, then you can carry that at net realizable value because there's no question as to what you can sell that gold for. I mean, there's an agreement amongst traders that this is the value of gold at the end of the year, whatever. And so they don't make you write it down um, to the uh, lower cost or market, whatever the market is that you can report it, even if the market is done above the cost. And they call that uh, net realizable value for this purpose, okay? Now you come over, that's one exception, okay? And you come over to the next page and we're gonna come back to some of this other stuff here in a second. But you come over to the next page and we have exceptions two and three. Okay, so when you make your three exceptions flashcard, you can go ahead, if you're mining precious metals, uh, farm products, whatever. Um, and then another exception is if the subsequent sales price of the end product is not affected by the market value. So what happens? You have a warehouse full of steel and steel is being used to manufacture automobiles, but the price of automobiles is going like this and you know you're gonna use that steel to manufacture automobiles, you don't have to write down the price of the steel because you know that ultimately you'll use that to produce automobiles and say the price, I mean, probably everything is going up, but the price of uh, automobiles is certainly going up, okay? And then you have a firm sales contract. So what happens? I've already contracted with you at the end of the year to sell you something for a million dollars. The market has dropped to 900,000, but what happens? I've got a contract to sell it for a million, so I don't have to write it down. Now you, on the other hand, in that scenario would have to take a loss, and I'm gonna show you what that'll look like because you're in a contract to purchase that for a higher amount than the market. And we'll see how that looks like uh, towards the end of the discussion of inventory today. Okay, so flashcard the three exceptions, gold and silver, final product isn't affected by the drop in the market price and uh, the company has a firm sales contract, okay? Now, this is a little annoying guys. And when I say annoying from the standpoint of FASB, wanted to improve things and I think that they went to improve things so much that they made it confusing okay so we have two different methods that we can use to determine if our market has fallen below our costs and thus we have to write our inventory down one is called the lower of cost or market okay and that is only okay for LIFO and dollar value LIFO. Okay, so we only use this if we're using LIFO methods. Just remember it that way, okay? 
every, every other method, we have to use the lower of cost or not, or net realizable value. Okay, so just put all other methods. Okay, so it starts to sound like, you know, Abraham Lincoln's uh, Gettysburg Address here. In the ordinary course of business, when the utility of goods are no longer as great as their cost, a departure from the cost basis principle of measuring inventory is required. This is usually accomplished, okay, by stating such goods at a market value or net realizable value. That's generally the case, okay? Now we will use what? We we'll use the lower of cost or market uh, when we get into um, the LIFO method, okay? Now, if we have to recognize this loss, okay, we will go ahead and write the inventory down and uh, the loss will be identified as part of cost of goods sold or if it's significant, okay, if it's very material, then we will call it out as a separate line item. It'll be considered almost like a non-operating item, but usually we just simply roll that right down into the cost of goods sold, debit the cost of goods sold, credit the inventory. Um, you know, on occasion, we may have a situation where we're gonna have to create a separate line item called loss on the value of inventory when we credit the inventory, but we have to write it down. And when it goes down, it stays down. Once we write it down, it stays down. We are not allowed to write it back up. And it's a little annoying because they keep saying under US GAAP, under US GAAP, which could lead uh, somebody to think, oh, uh, are we being tested on anything other than US GAAP on the CPA exam? And the answer is no. Okay, we only have to know US GAAP, but uh, Plash Card, those rules. We saw the exception. Okay, now we have the lower of cost or net realizable value, and we have the lower cost or market. And again, lower cost or market is what? LIFO methods only. Everything else uses what? Lower cost or net realizable value. Okay, so let's just take a look at that. And under US GAAP, the lower cost or net realizable value method is used for all inventory that is not costed using LIFO. The lower of net realizable value principle may be applied to a single item, a category or total inventory provided that the method is more clearly reflects periodic income. And what I want you to do is flashcard in Can you still hear me, guys? Yes. Hello? You yes. cut out. OK, but I'm, I'm back now. Can anyone see his screen? No. Yeah, we can't see your screen. Yeah, we can't see your screen. Okay, maybe I have to reshare. Hang on. Yeah? No. Yeah. There it is. Yes. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. Can you repeat what you were saying? Because all I, I guess I just saw you write that flashcard, but I couldn't hear what you were saying after that. Um, yeah. Um, when you value the inventory, you could value it by the entire inventory, categories of inventory or individual items. And I put wrote there, individual items are the most conservative method. I want you to flashcard that. Individual items are most conservative. So let's say I'm a clothes retailer and I have, you know, all of my inventory. I have men's and women's. And then I have, you know, shirts, men's shirts, men's pants, men's shoes, women's shirts, men, women's pants, women's shoes, which would be the individual categories. And so what happens if I go the entire inventory well, some things go up, some things go down, so they tend to cancel each other out, right? 
if I go by category, some things in the men's go up, some things in the women's go up, some things go down. And so what happens? There would be a canceling out. If you do individual items, there's less chance for the items drop in cost and cancel each other out. So individual items does what gives you the most conservative picture and that you don't have things because inventory tends to go down in value. So you don't have things sitting there canceling each other out. Okay. Uh, can, I, can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. So uh, under 3.3, you wrote some note of flashcard, find individual item. Individual items is the most conservative, what I just said, and I just gave an example of that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, now net realizable value, okay, just so we are comfortable with that, net realizable value is items net selling price. Net selling price means what? Selling price minus any discounts, whatever, less the cost and complete and disclose and dispose of the uh, inventory, okay? Now, when I was studying the exam, what do you mean dispose? You mean the cost to throw it away? No, they mean the cost to what? To deliver it, delivery cost. If there's some additional manufacturing or additional work that has to be done before you can sell it, that's all considered the selling price minus whatever it's gonna cost you to finish that up so you can sell it, like delivery costs, sales commissions, those sort of things. Okay. Okay. Now that's what we mean by net realizable value. So under the lower cost or net realizable value, compare the cost versus this net realizable value. The net realizable value is falling below the cost. You reported a net realizable value. If the net realizable value is above the cost, you reported at the cost, right? And that's for all methods except LIFO. Okay. LIFO methods, we use lower cost or market. Okay. And so now when we talk about, and again, that's LIFO only, okay? Or the retail inventory, LIFO, uh, retail inventory method. So, so just remember LIFOs, LIFO guys, the lower cost or market um, is the method that we need to use. Um, and again, same point here, the lower cost or market may be applied to single item category, um, or the entire inventory. And again, same flashcard up there, guys. These uh, individual items is most conservative. Same point there. Individual items is most conservative. Okay. Now, when we talk about market value in the phrase lower cost or market, the market value is the replacement cost. Okay. So we're going to have this replacement cost, and we're going to compare the replacement cost to the cost, and if it is lower, we'll record it at that lower replacement cost. But they put some parameters on this replacement cost. They make us calculate a market ceiling and a market floor, okay? Now, the market ceiling is what? is the net selling price less cost to complete and dispose and no you're not having deja vu we've already said that is the same as the definition of what net realizable value that we were using under the cost or net realizable value method okay the what the market value is the uh, the replacement cost is the cost, I should say not market value but the replacement cost is what it would cost us to replace the item. So if we have an item in inventory and we roll over it in a truck, what would it cost us to replace that? Okay, that's the replacement cost. And then the market floor is this market ceiling less a normal profit margin. So what we're going to do is we're going to know the cost and we're going to say, well, if the cost is above the replacement cost, we're going to use replacement cost, but we have to evaluate replacement cost. And if the replacement cost is what is over the ceiling, then we should just use the ceiling. If it's below the floor, then we should use what? We should use the floor. Okay. So at the end of the day, the market value is what? Is the middle amount. It's the middle amount between the market ceiling and the market floor. If the replacement cost 
is not more than the ceiling, not less than the floor, then it is the middle amount. If the replacement cost is over the ceiling, then the ceiling is the middle amount. If the replacement cost is below the floor, then the floor is the middle amount. So you always will pick that middle amount. Now, hang on before you panic, because when I looked at this shit, when I was studying the exam, I was like, oh, I'm getting every single one of these questions wrong. And the reason I was getting them all wrong is I didn't know the definition of market ceiling, market floor, and um, replacement cost. Okay, so flashcard the definition here really of market ceiling and market floor. Make sure you have that definition and remember that market ceiling is the same as the net realizable value, which we have to use in the lower of net or net realize lower of cost or net realizable value method, which is used for all other methods other than the LIFO methods. Okay, so come over and let's just start with this. And we start out talking about lower of cost or market. So what method are they using to account for the inventory here? If they're telling me low of cost or market. What is it gonna be? Gotta be LIFO. Okay, the question told me that, but the example told me that, but they didn't have to tell me that. If I'm using lower of cost or market, it's gotta be LIFO. So I'm gonna have to calculate what? Market ceiling, market floor, compare that to replacement cost and see if the uh, replacement cost is over the ceiling, I'll use the ceiling for my market. If it's below the floor, I'll use the floor for my market. If it's not over the ceiling and not below the floor, I'll use replacement cost. Then I'll compare that to cost to determine what the lower of the two is. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot, Faz. They're trying to help us. I don't know. And when I explain this to non-accountants, because uh, I'll get some, uh, when I teach the uh, accounting to non-accountants, they ask me, so how should I value inventory? And then when I explain it to them, they go, never mind, I'll hire an accountant to explain that to me. Okay. Unfortunately, we got to figure this out. Okay. So what happens? We have this cost for this item one. Let's just look at this example. We have this cost for this item one, and they're telling me the replacement cost is 19. Now, at first, Thought, I'm thinking, okay, well, then I should report it at the replacement cost because it is lower than the cost. But before I do that, I've got to evaluate to see if that replacement cost is over the ceiling or below the floor. So I take 25 minus the cost to complete. Again, could be delivery costs, sales commissions, that kind of thing. And I get what? I get 24, don't I? Then to get what? That's the ceiling. Then to get the floor, C is for ceiling, F is for floor. I subtract a normal profit from the ceiling and that gives me the floor here, which would make it what, 18, I guess? If I'm doing my math right, okay? So you look over and it kind of repeated that here. There's the 24, there's the 18, the ceiling, the floor, and the replacement cost is what? is 19 here, isn't it? So the replacement cost has not gone over the ceiling. It has not gone below the floor. It is what? It is less than the cost. So on my what, balance sheet, I'd report my inventory at 19. Question? Want to do another one or you're good? Another one? Okay. I'll do another one just because I find these kind of fun. Like when the um, Warriors game is on, I have my friends come over. And when they first walk in the door, they have to do a set of these before they can go watch the game. So when people used to come to my house 30 years ago, I used to make them do this. Okay. All right. So you come over and you have what? 30 minus 2 is what? 28 minus the 7 equals 21. My replacement cost is what? 20. Uh-oh, it has fallen what? It has fallen below the floor, hasn't it? The replacement cost I'm just going to bring down here is 20 now. It's fallen below the floor. And so since it's fallen below the floor, I'll report the inventory at what? At the 21. Can't go below the floor. And anyone who thinks that they have improved financial reporting for companies by this needs to get another job because I don't understand why they're doing this. I don't think they're improving anything. 
in financial reporting by all this nonsense, okay? But that's what they want us to do. I'm talking about FASB, okay? And you can play with the rest of these, you know, I think the Warriors play on Thursday, so you can set those up, you know, for your friends uh, when they come over, okay? Now, for a lower cost or net realizable value, that's all other methods, including FIFO, any other method that is not a LIFO method, okay? So now what happens? Well, now the cost is $28.50, and you simply subtract the selling price less the cost of complete. So now my net realizable value here is what? Is 27. And since what's happened, my what market has fallen below my cost, I'll report that at 27. Okay. Guys, the key to all this nonsense is what? You got to know the definitions, don't you? If you know the definitions, these questions get easier the more you work them. If you don't know the definitions, you're constantly struggling and you start building up a bunch of negative feelings about these questions. When in fact, you can get very good at these questions and uh, you know get a lot of uh, you know easy points, quick easy points on the exam. Okay, question about any of that? All right, that's a good point for a break because we're a little beyond the usual break time. So I'm going to go ahead, take a break, and we're going to come back and start talking about periodic versus perpetual. So we know what items to include. We know how to value what costs to include. We know how to value the inventory. So now we got to understand something about periodic versus perpetual. And then we're going to look at the different cost flow assumptions and see how they differ under the two uh, methods, periodic versus perpetual. Okay. All right, guys. So let's go ahead and take a break. I'm going to say that we're going to return here at seven, uh, at, at uh, six fifty. Okay. I'm going to pause the recording. Please, somebody remind me to resume the recording when we come back. <clears throat> Plays along, okay. And uh, as I mentioned, as we went into the break now, we're going to see um, how the perpetual versus the periodic inventory system works. And um, we're then going to apply those methods to different cost flow assumptions accordingly, uh, FIFO, LIFO, weighted average. We'll talk about moving average. And we'll talk about um, dollar value LIFO. And um, just to um, take a quick second to clean my glasses, um, when we talk about um, periodic method, that's sort of a method that is not used as much uh, currently, but uh, the examiners still ask about it. And it is also useful for us for making quick calculations on the CPA exam uh, when maybe they give us a question where they don't give us something like the beginning inventory amounts and they make us back into what that is. This formula that you see here for the periodic method is um, often very, very useful. So I do need you to flashcard this. I need you to know this like, um, you know, like a Catholic priest, I always say, you ever see the Catholic priest stands up and they do their little spiel and they're saying beginning inventory plus purchases equal goods available for sale minus ending inventory equals cost of goods sold. You got to know it like that. You can't sit there. How does it work again? And you have to know, for example, that costs like freight in go into the cost of inventory, right? So you gotta be very comfortable with this, okay? Because on the exam, they don't ask you cost of goods sold, that's too easy. They'll say, well, there was a fire and they don't know what the ending inventory was or something, then you're gonna have to back into it, right? So um, you need to, or they don't know what the beginning inventory was. So you need to be very, very comfortable with this, okay? 
Now, with the perpetual method, okay, which is more commonly used these days, because nowadays they scan everything when it comes in, right? So they know the cost and the cost is updated. And then when you go and you buy the thing, what happens? Bleep, they scan it and it gets taken out of inventory, okay? So because of the advent of scanners and the power of computing systems these days, most companies will use the perpetual method when an inventory comes in, we debit inventory, we credit cash or accounts payable probably. When the inventory item is sold, we debit cost of goods sold, we credit inventory, okay? Now, you take a look and um, they give us an example on the next page here, start with the heading here, perpetual versus periodic. And they give us a pretty good example of the difference of the two methods. Well, it's not a pretty good example. It's an okay example, but it has, some shortcomings, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill out the uh, rest of the story here for you because they kind of uh, left you hanging, okay? Uh, when it came to the periodic method. But let's just first look at the perpetual method, okay? Because perpetual method is pretty easy to understand. They do what? They sit here and they buy these 20,000 units and, um, they buy them for $5 per unit and then they sell them for uh, $7 per unit. Now under the perpetual method, and let's just do the journal entry for when they acquire it. When they buy these 20,000 units at $5 per unit, so they bought 20,000 units at $5 per unit. Well, that's not very helpful. It's not very good the way we did that. Um, what did they say? They did 20,000 units. Okay, but what I want you to put in is say that they, the original units cost, originally cost $5 per unit, and they purchased. Fifty thousand units. Okay, so they purchased fifty thousand units at um, five dollars per uh, at five dollar at. Uh, the hell happened to this example? What have they done to me here? One second, guys. Um make it um the hell are they doing to me one second guys sorry i thought i had this all figured out earlier today and then they uh threw a curveball at me by leaving out the number of units they had originally purchased which i hadn't realized till just now um <laughs> ha, 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 ha. This is funny. This is real funny. Um, okay. Okay. Um, Okay, yeah, so this is nonsense here. So don't look at this. Okay, here's what I want to look at. Okay, the comparison. Don't worry about that one up there. Okay, I'll, I'll write in. Um, oh, I see what they did to me. Okay, let's start with the purchase. I see why I'm getting confused. And you're probably why you would be confused too, because they um, made it confusing. Um, <laughs> Sorry, guys. Okay, let's just start down here. Okay, so what happens? They purchase 50,000 units and they purchase them for $6 per unit. Okay, now under the perpetual method, what would they do? They would debit inventory and they would credit cash because they sat there 
and uh, they purchase those items. And under the perpetual method, we have to do what? We have to sit there and debit inventory and cost of goods sold. Okay, so debit inventory, and they debit the inventory for three hundred thousand, and uh, they credit the cash. Okay, now when we are dealing with the uh, perpetual method, and let's just say under the perpetual method, if they purchase these for uh, six, um, when they sell these, and I don't care how many items they sold. Let's just not worry about the number of items they sold. Just put down here and don't worry about this up here because this is where it gets confusing. Why are they bringing in a new sales, a new cost here? And it doesn't flow, the example doesn't flow very well. So I'm just gonna continue here like this. Just say that they sell the items and they sell the items, uh, they sell sell $100,000 worth of items. And they sell them for 140,000. So it's $100,000 worth of items and they sell them for 140,000, okay? Now we're continuing with the perpetual method here. And under the perpetual method, upon the sale, we'd of course debit, and I think they're saying they sold them for cash. So let's just go ahead, we'll debit cash, 140,000 for the sale. We'll credit what? We'll credit sales. 140,000, okay? But we have to account for the cost of those items. So under perpetual method, we'll debit cost of goods sold for the 100,000 and we'll credit the inventory, right? 400,000. I don't care how many items they sold, it's not relevant for this question. So it's just simply for this example. So they simply confuse us by putting in the number of units up there. So, what happens when we credit inventory, now the balance in the inventory account is what? 200,000. And when I create my income statement, I'll have what? I'll have sales of 140,000. I'll have cost of goods sold of what? Of 100,000. And I'll have gross profit of how much? Of 40,000. With me so far, I know that's confusing, guys. But all we've done is we've looked at the perpetual method. We bought $300,000 worth of goods. We sold $100,000 worth. Don't worry about the unit price, okay, that we sold them for. We, under the perpetual method, for the sale, we debit cash. Under the perpetual method, we debit cost of goods sold. 100000 credit inventory, 100000 Any question on that so far? No? Okay, good. Now, if it's the periodic method, okay, under the periodic method, now let's just take a look here. Under periodic method, when you purchase the inventory, you debit purchases, you credit cash for the 300,000, okay, not inventory. So now we have what? Now we have this, uh, and I'll use blue over here. Now we have this purchases account here. It has 300,000. Now look, we need to end up here for our income statement. I don't care what method you use. You have to end up there for your income statement. So what happens? When we sell the goods, okay, we will debit, and this is for perpetual now, I mean, for periodic. And under the periodic method, we would go ahead and we would do what? we would um, have to calculate what our cost of goods sold is. So we would take beginning inventory and we would go ahead 
and we would have, and I'm assuming beginning inventory is zero. Our purchases are what? 300,000. That gives us what? Goods available for sale of 300,000. And under the periodic method, supposedly what you would do is you'd have to go and count the inventory to see what's left. Now, since we're doing this, you know, in a, in a classroom, I can look up there and I know that when they count, there's going to be 200,000 left, right? But under periodic, for the ending inventory, they actually would have to count it, wouldn't they? Okay, but the count shows that there's how many left? 200,000. So through this calculation, we come up with cost of goods sold of 100,000. I know you're saying, well, John, I already know that because you just showed me that for perpetual, but theoretically under what? Under our uh, periodic method, we would have had to account the inventory, okay? Now for the sale, we're still going to do what? We're still going to make the journal entry to even under periodic to do what? To debit the cash credit the sales for 140. Okay. But right now, our cost of goods sold doesn't even exist as an account, right? So, what we would do is we now have achieved the objective of figuring out our goods available for sale. So, now we can go ahead and, of course, I'm going to run out of room. We can credit, and I guess I'll have to write it down here, guys. We can credit purchases. for 300,000, that's a credit to purchases. That says purchases credit 300,000. We can debit inventory. How much is the ending inventory? We counted it and we know that it's what? 200,000 and we just calculate our cost of goods sold. So now we can debit it for 100,000, right? And so when we prepare our income statement, we end up in the same place, don't we? So using perpetual versus periodic doesn't change the outcome of our financial statements. It's just a different way, two paths to the same outcome, okay? And I apologize. You know, I don't know if I have to apologize. I wouldn't have done it this way. Showing you the sales and then not explaining what happens here with the rest of the story here is to me what gets a little bit irritating. So if you see the whole story kind of right here for the whole thing, because I like to purchase inventory before I sell it. And I don't see any point why they change the unit price up here. That just creates a bunch of confusion because now you know it's not a continuous example and you can't kind of follow the whole thought process through the way they showed it. So question. Okay, good. So let's get into the cost flow assumptions. And we're going to start with something that is not really a cost flow assumption, which is specific identification method. Okay. Under specific identification, we sit there and we calculate our inventory and our cost of goods sold based on the item that was actually sold. Okay. So it's typically used for high value dollar items. Go ahead and flashcard that it allows for income manipulation. I mean, I find that a little annoying because it uh, kind of assumes that the market is going to, you know, bow to our will. So if we want to generate more sales, we sell the higher ticket items to generate more sales. I find that a little annoying because there has to assume that there's a demand for our product, but that doesn't mean that the CPA exam might have put something stupid like that on it. So uh, just go ahead and flashcard. The specific identification is used for large ticket items. You sell a car, you uh, you debit the cost of goods sold, the inventory for the cost of that specific vehicle identification number, and you book the sale for whatever that amount was, right? Specific identification. Okay, first in, first out, okay, and they tell us that under first in, first out, the first cost inventory or the first cost transferred to the cost of goods sold, okay? Now, um, what you can do is put a little 
you don't even have to write this example down, guys. I'm going to put the little a little visual down here. You don't have to put anything, okay? So I don't know if you ever go to like Safeway, ever been to Safeway, and you go to Safeway and they have the milk freezer back there, milk fridge back there, whatever, okay? And what happens? You come up with your, uh, you're going to see now why I became an accountant, okay? I can't draw, that's you, okay? And you come up with your little shopping cart, right? And in there, they have these milks, okay? And um, the milks cost $4.25, and that was at uh, June 1st. They cost them, they cost, this is Safeway's cost, they're selling the milk sales price is going to be $5, whatever. Okay. But they originally cost $4.25. And um, on 630, because we're assuming a period of rising, uh, 615, I should say, because we're considering a period of rising prices, they were four, they now are 450. And by 630, okay, and prices are almost doing this right now, right? They're at 475. Okay, so we got a period of rising prices. So what happens? Under first in, first out, they assume that you go in and you grab that milk and you put it in your cart at 425. So the cost of goods sold is what? Is 425? Okay. The value of the ending inventory is what? Value of the ending inventory is. 475, okay, and those are the ones that were basically what just delivered by the Safeway truck. Does Safeway have a good trucking distribution system? Go ahead, get in their way sometime on the way to a Safeway store, see what happens to you, okay? So they go ahead and they have those milks that get delivered, and the uh, cost will assumption is the 425 ones get sold. Now, I'll have some students say to me, well, when I go to the milk store, I reach to the back, okay? And I get the newer ones, right? And so what does Safeway do? Safeway simply changes the date on the dairy products. No, I'm just kidding. What Safeway assumes, they don't care if you go and jump in the truck and beat the guy up and take the new ones. They don't care. They assume you grab the 425 ones, okay? So if we're sitting here, and we're looking at what? We're looking at our income statement. Our sales price is five. Our cost of goods sold is what? Is 425. And so we have what? We have gross profit of 75 cents, don't we? Okay. Now, if you look at this, I want you to make a flashcard here. Advantage of FIFO and the advantage of FIFO is what? Ending inventory approximates replacement cost. What we're showing in ending inventory is pretty much what it was costing them at the end of you know the period, right? December 31st, whatever, right? Okay. So ending inventory approximates replacement cost. What else? Um, relates to actual flow of goods. It relates to the actual flow of goods in most cases. Relates to the actual flow of goods, right? Okay. However, disadvantage of FIFO, disadvantage of FIFO, it tends to do what? It tends to over state net income. Okay, and that's a flashcard for disadvantage. It tends to do what? It tends to overstate net income. That says overstate net income. Because think about it, what's happening? 
We're saying that our cost of goods sold is 425. Is it really? By the time we get to the end of the accounting period, the cost it would really cost us for selling things is what is 475, isn't it? So it tends to overstate net income. Okay. Thus, another flashcard that you should make right here. And finally, we have a pass key that is helpful. Okay. In a period of rising prices, what's going to happen? The FIFO method will end up in the highest ending inventory. The what? The lowest cost of goods sold, and therefore what? The higher gross profit, the higher net income, right? Okay. All right, good. Now, just to help us with the comparison now between perpetual and periodic. Oh, let me say something before we leave those flashcards up there. Um, I'm having you flashcard this advantage disadvantage for FAR on the exam. I had a dream that they ask about advantage disadvantage of FIFO versus LIFO as an essay question on BEC. Only BEC ask you essay questions, right? Okay, so keep these flashcards handy for BEC because um, they may very well ask you as a, a nice essay question for that, okay? Okay, now the other dream I had because no one ever tells me what's on their exam, but in my dreams, people tell me what was on their exam. And um, in my dream, students told me that they had to calculate the cost of goods sold and the ending inventory, and they had to do it under FIFO, LIFO weighted average. So it's not a bad idea for this example, which we're gonna first use these facts for FIFO, then we'll use them for weighted average, we'll use them for LIFO, that you go ahead and you flashcard these facts. And when you come upon these facts in your flashcards, you should be able to stop, bust out a piece of paper and sit there and calculate the required, which is what? The ending inventory under both uh, uh, periodic, the ending inventory and cost of goods sold under both periodic and perpetual. So in effect, we're putting a what? In your flashcard, you're gonna have to stop and do a task-based simulation, okay? When you're going through your flashcards, all right? So in this example, they tell us that during the first year of operations, Helix Corporation has purchased half of its inventory in three batches. Batch one was for 4,000 units, they paid 425 per unit. Batch two was for 2,000 units and they paid 450 per unit. And batch three, they bought 3,000 units at 475 per unit. In total, 4,000 units were sold 3,000 units after the first purchase and 1,000 units after the second purchase. And again, we're going to calculate ending inventory, cost of goods sold using what? Periodic using perpetual, okay? Now, they start to give us the solution down here. And I think it's helpful to first figure out, well, how many units did they, set, did they buy? Uh, they just began operations, right, during their first year of operations. So they bought 4,000, 2,000, 3,000. So they bought a total of, what, 9,000 units? They sold, the question tells me what? 4,000. So that means the ending inventory is going to have what? 5,000 units in it, right? Sold the 4,000. So we're gonna have ending inventory of 5,000 units, okay? Now, notice that since they sold 4,000 units under FIFO, those are all gone, aren't they? There's no more of those left, right? And then to calculate my ending inventory of the 5,000 that are left, 2,000 are costed at 450 and 3,000 are costed at 475. So you add that up, the ending inventory is 23,250. Beginning inventory, which is zero plus purchases, gives us goods available for sale. Minus the ending inventory that we just calculated means that my what? That my um, cost of goods sold is 17,000. 
Okay. Question. Okay, good. Now we come over and under the perpetual system, okay, under the perpetual system, what happens? Under perpetual, we're going to have to update our inventory records after each purchase, each sale. So when we buy the inventory, we do what? We debit the inventory account, 17,000, we credit cash accounts payable, whatever, right? When we bought those 4,000. Then when they sell the 3,000, we credit inventory, we debit the cost of goods sold, don't we? Right, okay. Then what? Then when we buy um, another 2,000 units at 450, we debit the inventory, credit the accounts payable, whatever. And then when we sell those thousand units, again, we still have a thousand of those left. So they go out at 425. A thousand times 425 means we will credit the inventory, debit the cost of goods sold. Now, notice what, guys? We get the same answer, don't we? We get the same answer for the cost of goods sold and the ending inventory, whether we use periodic or perpetual, because the assumption was that all those units went out at 425. Okay, so that brings me to what? Uh, that brings me back up, turn back to um, the next um, thing up here. And I going back, and I, I already told you to flashcard that, but just taking a look right here at ending inventory and cost of goods sold are the same. It didn't change those numbers. It was 17,000 for the cost of goods sold and what, and uh, 23,250, regardless of whether we use periodic or perpetual. And that's gonna become important because we're gonna see questions in which they ask us to calculate the ending inventory or they ask us to calculate the cost of goods sold and if it's what? And then they give us a column for periodic and perpetual. If it's FIFO, we know the correct choice is gonna be the one that shows the same amount for each, right? Now they may have every single choice showing the same amount from each of them. That's not gonna help us much, but we might see that some of the choices have different amounts and then we're gonna know that what? We can eliminate those as choices, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now, you come over, that's FIFO. Let's take a look at weighted average, okay? And I'm just going to jump to the um, example here for weighted average. And guys, um, what you can do in the flashcard that I asked you, flashcard the facts, and then you don't have to repeat the facts, but on your flashcard, say do it for FIFO, do it for weighted average, do it for LIFO, right? Okay, so I'm saying flashcard. I don't mean that you have to repeat the flashcard of the facts and give yourself writer's cramp, but you should be able to then be able to do what you see here, which is what? They bought 9,000 units, didn't they? And they sat there and they extended those out at the various costs. So the total cost was 40,250. 40,250 divided by the total 9,000 units gives me a cost per unit of 4.7222. Be careful, make sure on the exam, if you're doing that, you get some irrational number like this, that when you actually calculate the cost of goods sold in the ending inventory, you're leaving these what, irrational numbers in your calculator because it could make a difference when you extend that out. And we know that they sold from the fact pattern 4,000 units. And you simply take that average weighted to average cost per unit times the 4,000. And for ending inventory, there was 5,000 units in ending inventory. We know we extend that out. Now, if you're on the exam and they ask you FIFO, LIFO weighted average, which one are you going to do first? I think you jump immediately to weighted average, right? So you know you got that out of the way. Okay, then I'd probably go to FIFO and then I'd save LIFO for last. Okay, now I don't think in a task based simulation they're going to ask you moving average. Okay, but they uh, will probably ask you one or two multiple choice questions in moving average. Okay, and with moving average, a new weighted average is calculated after each purchase. 
we must have a perpetual system to use the moving average. So there is no happen to know perpetual versus periodic. Under moving average, we must use the perpetual, we must use a perpetual to be able to use moving average, okay? Now, let's just look at this example. And this is a pretty good example. And again, cost of goods sold and in, in the ending inventory under moving average. Again, I don't think this would be a task-based simulation, but they went ahead and continued the pattern, same fact pattern for this. And they go ahead and they bring in those units at 425. So right now, there's only one cost in there, the 425 per unit, right? The 17,000, 4,000, 425. When they sell, they do what? They sold the 3,000 units. Remember before the, um, when they sold those, they sold them out at 425. And so they went ahead and uh, debited the cost of it sold for this, um, what is it, 12,750, credited the inventory, and now the inventory has this 4,250. Then they bring in what? Then they bring in 2,000 units at 450, okay? So that's a total of 9,000 that's gonna get added on to the 4,250. So now they've got what? This 13,250. So 13,250 divided by the now 3,000 units right there. The thousand that were left at 425, um, the, excuse me, yeah, the thousand that were left at 425 plus the additional 2,000 that they just bought, right? So that gives me what? A new moving average cost of 4.4167, okay? You can see how they calculated that below and you see that that's in there now as a system. So when they sell those next thousand units, which came after the second purchase, now they cost those out at what? 4.4167, so they'll debit cost of goods sold 4.4167. Seven, okay, 4417, 44167, rounded to 4417, and credit the inventory for the 4417. Now they have 8833 of cost in there. And when they bring in those new ones at 475, now we can calculate a new moving average. We bring in that 14,250, 8833 plus the 14,250 divided by now. The 5,000 units, that's what the 2,000 that were left plus the additional three I've just bought, gives me a new moving average cost. And I would use that for my next um, sale as to what will go into the cost of goods sold and what the credit will be to inventory. Okay. Now, um, I think any moving average question you put will just take you through one round of that. They're not going to make you do another round. So they'll just say, hey, here's what the original purchase was. Here's what the additional purchase was. Here's the new moving average cost. And they might ask you, what's the inventory after that? Or they might ask you, what was the cost to get sold after that? Question? OK, good. Now we come over and we continue this interesting fact pattern now with last in, first out. OK, but let's just first look at last in first out method and here they tell us that under lifo the last cost inventory are the first cost transferred to cost to get sold so what i like to do with this one is just bring you down here but let's just kind of use our imagination so it goes with our question a little bit let's say our six one items came in at what came in at 425, okay? Now let's say this is a pile of rocks, okay? Um, you know, I don't know if you've ever like done any kind of landscaping and you decided to put some decorative rock. So you hire some guys to do what? To come over and get the rocks from the rock company. This is rock company, okay? And when the guys show up, what do they do? They not going to, you know, tell the rock dealer, hey, you know, knock down the pile because we want those 425 ones. They're going to do what? The rock dealer is selling them for five bucks, regardless of pound or whatever it is, however they measure rock sales, okay? But they're selling them for four or five dollars. But what happens? They're going to pull off the top, aren't they? So the first 
costs that go into cost of goods sold are the 475 ones, right? And the ending inventory is going to be down here at what? At, uh, and they would have bought these at 615, these at 630, of course, just to continue with our example. And the ending inventory is these 425 ones, okay? Because when they get a delivery of rocks, the rocks get dumped on top. And when they have a sale, it goes what? It goes into the cost gets sold off the top, okay? Now look, if Safeway wanted to, they could use LIFO. It doesn't have to deal with the actual flow of goods, right? They, it's cost flow assumption, okay? Now, um, when you look at this, if you were the rock company, you show what? Sales price of sales, well, I can't show sales price, but you put sales of what? $5. You have cost of goods sold of what? Of 425, and you have gross profit here of what? I mean, excuse me, 475. And you have gross profit here of what? 0.25. Okay. Okay, good. Now, let's go ahead and let's look at a couple things coming back up. Okay. Um, and let's do it this way. Let's do it this way. Let's just go with, uh, I guess right here. Okay, flash card. Disadvantage. of LIFO. Let's do disadvantages of LIFO, ready? Disadvantages of LIFO, okay. Um, ending inventory will be what? Will be understated. Ending inventory is understated because what's happening? We're sitting here saying that these things are costing us 425 when really they're costing us what? 475? So ending inventory is going to be understated, okay? Um, LIFO does not relate to flow of goods. For most companies, for most companies, right? It does not relate to flow of goods because most companies want to sell you the old stuff first, don't they? Okay, so, but it doesn't matter. They can use LIFO even though it doesn't, um, um, you know, match the actual flow of goods. Um, so uh, ending inventory will be understated, of course, in rising prices, but more generically does not, reflect current prices. I'll read that back to you. Does not reflect current prices. Okay, I'm saying understated because I'm assuming rising prices, but does not reflect current prices. Okay. Um, big disadvantage. Subject to income manipulation. And that's a huge disadvantage. It is subject to income manipulation. Well, what are we talking about there? Come back to the little example we have down here, okay? If I could write in and I'm gonna say, hey, I'm gonna be the new CEO of this rock company. And I'm gonna, increase our profits, okay? So what do I do? I see I have a period of rising prices and I go ahead and I tell my purchasing agent, don't buy anything for a while. Let these piles, we're holding too much inventory. And I let these piles deplete down. So now I only have enough units down here, what, that would relate to layer one, okay? So what happens now when people buy stuff, I only have cost in my system, 
that is showing 425. And so what happens? I sit here, I'm still selling them for five. I do what? I showing cost of goods sold, right? My sales are 425. My cost of goods sold is 425. Boom, I'm a genius. I have gross profit now of what? Of 75. And by the time I'm, you know, getting my golden parachute and heading out the door, this company's in a very precarious position because now they're going to have to go into the market and try to do what? Try to reacquire these rocks to replenish their inventory or what? Maybe by then they're $5 uh, per unit to purchase these inventory. And all of a sudden there's going to be a rude awakening in the market for this company, right? So even though IFRS is not tested on the exam, uh, IFRS has said no. You cannot use LIFO. LIFO is for, for, for forbidden under um, the um, uh, in IFRS, which is not tested on the exam, okay? And one of the big reasons that IFRS was not accepted in the US is this LIFO conformity rule, which is not a disadvantage necessarily, but something that you flashcard which says that if you use LIFO for financial reporting purposes, you got to use it for tax purposes, okay? So what happens? They don't want companies sitting here doing what? Doing this kind of thing for their financial reporting purposes, showing something like this, and at the same time getting the what? For tax purposes, getting this nice little, uh, well, actually using, say, uh, I should say using FIFO, and under FIFO, you know, showing this kind of nice financial um, outcome over here, you know, where you're getting to show this $75 of, of uh, you know, 75 cents, whatever, of gross profit where my income statement go right here. You're getting to do this for financial reporting purposes. Meanwhile, for tax purposes, you're getting to do what? You're getting to do this thing uh, over here where you're showing less uh, tax. And so they came back and they said, no, if you use it for your um, financial reporting, for your tax purposes, you also have to use it for financial reporting purposes. So we get a consistent look there at what you're doing. and You're not able to kind of bump things up. Um, well, companies did like that. Companies don't like not having to be able to use LIFO for tax purposes because they don't want to pay more tax. They don't want to not be able to use it and have to pay more tax. And so they went to Congress and they said, if you allow the Security Exchange Commission to make us all go over to IFRS, the terrorists have won. They'd say whatever they needed to say to stop that from happening, the main reason being that they don't want to pay more taxes. And so that was probably the death knell for IFRS in the United States more than anything was that LIFO conformity rule. Okay. Now, um, just to put advantage of LIFO, okay? And the advantage of LIFO is right here. So flashcard advantage. The advantage of LIFO is that if you use, uh, it better matches revenue against expenses because it matches current costs with current revenues, okay? So that's good. That's a good thing, that's an advantage, okay? Now you come over and let's just flashcard finally right here, the mirror image of what? Of uh, FIFO, which is during periods of inflation, what happens? LIFO shows a lower ending inventory and what? A higher cost of goods sold and therefore a lower net income. Okay, question. All right, good. Let's take a look over here at the same fact pattern that you had flashcarded. And uh, now you're going to be able to apply it to uh, LIFO. Okay, and again, you don't have to write the facts again, but now apply them to LIFO. And again, remember, we're going to do the cost of goods sold and the ending inventory under periodic and perpetual, okay? Now, under, and just to remind ourselves, we bought, what, 9,000 units? We sold, what, 
4,000. So ending inventory equals how many units? 5,000 units. Okay. And so we come over and what happens under LIFO, under the periodic system, start with that. Under the periodic system, when we sell those 3,000 units, when we sell those 4,000 units, we'll first sell those. So now those are all gone. But to fill that first sale, we still need what? We still need a thousand units that are sold. And then there's another thousand that are what? Still here. That's a still here. So a thousand units still here times 450s where they got that 4,500 extension. Okay. And then they didn't, they sold 4,000 units. They didn't sell any more. So we have a thousand units at 450, 4,000 units at 425. We multiply that out. That's the 17,000. We add those together. Now our ending inventory is 21,250. Okay. So we have the goods available for sale, which is the same thing it was under um, FIFO, minus the um, ending inventory gives us the cost of goods sold of 18,750. Now, this is where it gets interesting, guys. And this is where you really got to be careful on a question. If the question shows you that they did what? They sold some units before they bought additional units then you're going to have to go with whatever cost is in your system to record that sale under LIFO at that point in time. Okay. So they sold what 4,000 units on um, they bought, I should say 4,000 units. They debit the inventory credit accounts payable, whatever. And then when they sell the units, pay attention now, when they sell the units, they do what? They only have one cost in their system. And under perpetual, I have to update my inventory. My cost gets sold after every sale, don't I? Every purchase, every sale. So I have to, at this point, only use that 425. So I debit my cost of goods sold for 12750 and I credit the inventory, right? What do you want me to do? I got to update the inventory account and I only have one cost in there. Then they bring in the 450 ones because the problem told us that they um, had the second sale after the second purchase. So I bring in those 450 ones. And now when I do my sale, I have a later cost in there, don't I? So when I sell those thousands, thousand units, I got to bring those out at what? At this 450 cost. So I credit the cost of goods sold. I debit my, uh, I mean, I credit my inventory debit, my cost of goods sold. And then they bring in those 3,000 at 475. They didn't sell any of those. So we bring those in and notice that what? I get a different answer for my ending inventory, my cost of goods sold under LIFO, don't I? Okay. So under the LIFO method, They say that they don't give the same number. Um, I don't know if they say it somewhere. Anybody see it? That's okay. We'll write it in. I don't know. They might say it, um, but just flashcard down here. They might say it, but I don't know where. Flashcard what? Under LIFO ending inventory and cost of goods sold will not be the same number. Um, for periodic versus perpetual. I don't know why the book doesn't say that somewhere. Maybe they do, I can't find it. But um, the point here being what, maybe they say it down there. Anyway, don't worry, you got a flashcard there under LIFO ending inventory cost goods sold will not be the same for perpetual versus uh, periodic. And that's important because if I get a question and they're asking me LIFO and they're asking me ending inventory or cost of goods sold, I know the what? I know the answer that shows the same is immediately gonna be eliminated, isn't it? Okay.
Okay, good. Uh, dollar value life, though. Okay, and guys, I almost want to grip my teeth when I say this. Um, I look at um, the Facebook FAR group, and it drives me insane. Okay, uh, because I see. I see people who can't pass the exam trying to help people who can't pass the exam. That's how I would describe the, the uh, Facebook uh, group. Okay, so I don't want you to get involved in that. But one of the things that I see that all the time in there is, uh, I can't understand dollar value life. <laughs> and I'm like, all you need to do is follow this right here. If you follow this right here, it is not that bad. In fact, it becomes kind of fun, okay? So under dollar value LIFO, there's no need to fear dollar value LIFO. Under dollar value LIFO, method inventory is measured in dollars and is adjusted for changing price levels. And we need a price index to do so. And this is how you calculate that price index. Now, I think what might be derailing some folks is you have to realize that you have to take the total ending inventory at current year cost and then you have to divide that by the total ending inventory at base year cost. I think where sometimes students candidates run into problems they try to calculate the index just based on what got added for the period. No, it's the total. That's the key thing. Okay, so write in that total, that word total there, but let's just look over here and uh, you can see and any questions going to have to give you the base year, they're going to have to get you the current year, otherwise you can't calculate the index. Okay, now they tell us that at to what, at the year one base year, okay, and then they tell us what the year one layer, what was added that year. Okay, what was added that year, and they have to give it to you at base year, at current year. You add whatever the beginning was, plus whatever layer was added that year, that gives you the total at year end, doesn't it? And you have the total at what? You have it at base, you have it at current year, you follow the formula, but I do want you to flash card up there, you follow that formula, Congratulations, CPA. You just calculated the index, didn't you? Okay. Now, sometimes the problem will say the company calculates, and you'll be like, well, if the company calculates it, where is it? You know, the answer is saying you have to calculate when they say the company calculates it, right? But there's the price index. Okay. Now, once you get the price index, what you do is you pick up the layer that was added at base year and you multiply it by what by the index that that just calculated congratulations you just turned base year into current year didn't you and then you go ahead and you add that layer in at the current year and that's the ending inventory now at current dollars base year stays at base year the only things you have to adjust are the what are the current year adjusting base to current. Now, most problems will only make you go through the one year, okay? Um, if they made you do another year, they'd have to give you what got added in at base year for year two in this example, what got added in at current year in this example, 60, 80, we take what? We take the total. We follow the formula, the total divided by the base year gives me the index. We pick up what was the layer at base year. We multiply it by the index. We just turn that base year cost into a current year cost for that layer. We add it, the 20,000 to the previous balance. We're now at 66,000. Most problems will only make you go through one layer, but if they make you do two, that's how you do two. Okay. Okay, now some problems might sit there and give you 
the price index. So if they sometimes they get cumulative, they say it's internally calculated, which means you're going to have to calculate it. But in this question, they gave me the index. Well, if they give me the index, and I think this thing says you should still make this table, I'm like, what for? Unless I'm going to also make a set of chairs to go with this table. I don't care for this table. They gave me the index. And if I know that what they had, and they give me, they'd have to give me the base year, and the base year had 500, and then it got up to what? 525 at base year. This is at base year. This is all base year. Yeah, my paper's crapping out over here, but this is all base year. They ended, they began with what, 50. They end with 525. Then that means they must have added a layer of what? 25,000 at base year. But I have to turn this into what? I have to turn it into current year. So I take that 25,000. I multiply it by the index. Thank you, God. I'm not trying to strike that out because that's important. What's happening? Am I losing something? You guys still with me? I don't know why they're playing music for me at this point. Okay, but I, oh, is that what it is? They're not going to let me change. And I'm not going to bother. Okay, so let me still, still let me erase. So what happens? We have what? We have that dollar 10 up there. We have that 1.10, it's not a dollar 10. We multiply it by what? By the 25,000, that means that I just turned the layer, your one layer into current dollars. I add it to my base year beginning. I don't have to sit there and reconstruct that table up there. That's ridiculous. Okay. Okay, good. Let's do this because we're getting kind of late here. Okay. Um, Let's quickly look at the gross profit method, okay? Uh, gross profit method, okay? And the way the CPA exam tends to talk about this method is if you don't have information about your ending inventory. In this example, it got destroyed, okay? So what happens? Well, if you have your sales, you have your beginning inventory, you have your purchases, you just don't know what the ending inventory is, and in this example, they tell us that there's a gross prop profit percentage of 20%. That means that I have what? A cost percentage of 80%, doesn't it? Okay. So if your sales were 200,000 and you multiply it by the cost percentage, your gross profit percentage of minus one gives me an 80% cost percentage. That means my cost of goods sold is 160,000. And here we go. Now I can use that periodic sort of Catholic priest formula, 100,000 beginning inventory, add the purchases, right? That's goods available for sale. I just estimated what the cost of goods sold using that cost percentage. So my ending inventory must have been 40,000. Firm purchase commitment. Remember we said that what? If you are obligated to buy inventory at a certain price, even though you haven't taken constructive receipt of that inventory yet, okay, you have committed to purchase it at 5 million. If the value falls down to 4 million, you have to take a loss. You will literally debit loss on your, for your income statement and credit and liability. Okay, so what we're gonna do with the time we have left is we're gonna take a look at these couple of questions, okay? And I'm gonna do the first one with you. And then I'm gonna ask you to work the second one. I'm gonna stay with you while you work it, but I'm gonna ask you to work that one a little bit more on your own, okay? But let's look at this first one, okay? And the reason I wanna work this one with you is because I wanna show you how to uh, avoid falling into the trap that the examiners want you to follow, fall into. 
Okay, so the examiners are looking at this and they're saying that we had beginning inventory was understated by 26,000, ending inventory was overstated by 52, and how did that affect the cost of goods sold? Now, the mistake, the common mistake that students make is they try to handle, deal with both those problems simultaneously. Figure out the effect on cost of goods sold for each of these misstatements separately, and then figure out the effect on cost of goods sold. So I'm going to first do this situation with the ending inventory, which they tell me was understated by what? 26,000. So using my little, you know, Catholic priest thing, my beginning inventory, right? Plus what? Plus purchases gives me goods available for sale minus ending inventory gives me what? The cost of goods sold. So I'm just going to think about the effect of the ending inventory, which again, just to remind myself, they said it under it was understated by 26,000. So I'm going to put a minus 26,000. Is 26,000 too low? I don't care what the purchases were. Doesn't matter. That means that the what? That the goods available for sale must also be understated by 26,000. Just looking at the effect of what the ending inventory did to the goods available for sale, right? Now, even though they give me information about the ending inventory, and I might be able to use that here, I like to just say, don't worry about that right now, John, because I don't want to get myself confused. Just know that because the what beginning inventory was 26,000 too low, the cost of goods sold is what. 26,000 too low, gotta be, okay? Now I'm going to deal with the issue with the ending inventory, okay? So I don't care what the beginning inventory was, doesn't matter, okay? I don't care what the purchases were, the goods available for sale, doesn't matter. I just wanna isolate what happened with the ending inventory. And they told me that the ending inventory is what is 78,000, I mean, excuse me, not 78,000, but what? Now you know what the answer is. Was 58, was 52,000 too what? Too high? So in effect, what happened? I subtracted too much from my goods available for sale. And so my cost of goods sold would be what? 52,000 too low? because I subtracted too much from my goods available for sale and calculating my cost of goods sold. So the effect of both of these problems was to what? Understate my cost of goods sold, wasn't it? So as a result of these two mistakes, my ending inventory is 78,000 too low, understated. Okay. Now, I often get students that say, well, that's more confusing to me. I'm better doing it all at once. Well, then go ahead. I'm just telling you, if you're comfortable with doing it all at once, fine. But I'm telling you that the mistake that I see is you get halfway through that, trying to think one thing's going one way, one thing's going the other, and you lose yourself. Okay. Okay, good. Let's look at this last question with a couple, couple minutes. We're going to go a little over, guys. But with the couple of minutes that we have left, let's go ahead and I want you to work this one. And then we're going to come back and look at it after I give you some time with it.
Okay, we're at three minutes. I'm going to give you another 30 seconds, guys. Okay, good. Um, I'm optimistic. I feel good um, because 92% of us got it correct and nobody picked, oops, uh, nobody picked C or D. So that's all good. I mean, I wish everyone got it right, but uh, we're going to take a look at how we would have gotten to the right answer. But just quickly, test taking technique before we get into why B is correct. Um, you start to look, and we know that under what? Under LIFO, when you have this situation where what? Where an additional purchase came in after the last sale, the answer what? Cannot be the same. So C and D are gone. You just moved your, you just doubled your chances of getting this question right just by remem remembering that one fact, right? Okay. Now, when I look at this, I don't know, sometimes, guys, depending on what kind of mood I'm in, sometimes perpetual seems easier to me. Sometimes periodic seems easier to me. For this one, uh, for some reason, perpetual seems easier to me, okay? So when I look, I see that they, what? They had a purchase of 800 units. They're using the, um, they're asking me the perpetual system. So under perpetual, what happens? Well, these units weren't here for me to sell, and they're asking me, and the other mistake I make, guys, is I go through all this crap and I calculate cost of goods sold when the damn thing was asking me the inventory. So make sure you know what you're calculating, right? So they're asking me the inventory. So I know right off the gate, what, right out of the gate, that that $4,000 worth of stuff is all still there, isn't it? Because it wasn't there when they had the sale, so they couldn't assume that they sold in a perpetual, right? So I know I got to include that 4,000. And when I do that, <laughs> right, I'm done because I can't get to 2,600, okay? So I would really be done with one calculation or one realization here. I don't even have to do a calculation, okay? But just to keep going with this to see where they got the 5,400 from, well, if they sold what? If it tells me that they sold 1,800, then they're done with what? They don't have any more of those, but to get it to 1800, they still need what? They still need another 600 units. So you take the 2000 minus the 600, I'll just write it here, 2000, right? Minus the 600 units. That means they're left with what? 1400 of those $1 ones. So 1400 extending out times $1 is obviously 1400. You add that in, you get the 5400. And now you really know, go to hell, you stupid thing, that 5,400 is the right answer, right? It was right for me, is, right, is the right answer. But let's go ahead and let's do periodic. Why not, okay? So what happens? You sit here, because some of you said, well, I did periodic first. Well, what happens? I have beginning inventory, which they told me, beginning inventory was what? 2,000, okay? I have what? I have purchases. And the purchases came in, they told me right here at what? At 3,600. Just picking these numbers up at 3,600 and then at 4,000. So I have purchases of what? Um, 76. So 76 plus the 2,000 means that there's goods available for sale here of 9,600. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and calculate my cost of goods sold, okay, which is sort of the bottom line in our little Catholic priest form. I'm going to raise this. So my cost of goods sold, and I let under last in, first out, I assume that to make up the 1800 units that they sold what? They sold all of those 800 times five equals the 4,000. And I still need what? I still need, I guess, uh, what? A thousand of these $3 ones, right? 
So a thousand, it's the step is in my way now. Come on. A thousand. At three dollars, right? Are still there, or got sold. So that's three thousand. That's what seven thousand dollars is my cost of goods sold. So how can I create a cost of goods sold of seven thousand when I have goods available for sale in the inventory? Uh, goods available for goods available for sale of nine thousand six hundred. I must have what had an ending inventory of twenty six hundred that I subtracted to get me to the seven thousand. Right. So I don't know. I think in this particular question, and it varies from question to question, I think perpetual is easier. But sometimes I get students that'll say, no, I think that uh, periodic was easier, whatever. Most important thing here is what? If you got rid of C and D, and you know the numbers have to be different, pick your favorite punch and go ahead and do what? Figure that one and you're done, right? And then if you feel you've got a cushion of time, which most people that take the FAR exam never really, I, I've never had any student come to me and say, oh, the FAR exam gave me way too much time, okay? So, um, you know, you probably will feel time crunch. So this might, for a question like this, might be a good way of, taking a question that's going to maybe take most candidates three minutes and some candidates are going to err into spending more than three minutes on any one question which you're never going to make that mistake you can maybe work this thing in a minute a minute and a half okay okay good guys that gets us through the inventory module i uh, wish we were going faster but i'd rather be thorough than fast at this point so um you should be able to get all the way through module three for chapter three. We'll finish it up next time. Uh, make sure you're keeping up with your homework agenda. Okay. Questions? Okay, guys. I will see you next week. And uh, stay tuned for information on the books, okay, for the folks that were worried about that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Good night.